Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Rachel, uh, can you hear me okay? Thank you. We'll call to order the uh, board workshop for the Community Transit Board of Directors here on October 22nd. This quarterly board workshop is, of course, being held virtually in accordance with the Governor's Stay at Home Order Proclamation in 20-28, which we're becoming familiar, quite familiar with. The meeting is recorded. Uh, remind member, board members and presenters, please keep your phone on and computer on mute unless you're speaking. That would be great and help everybody involved. Um, and so that board members can see each other uh, more easily, we ask that only board members and speakers turn their cameras on. If you're joining by phone, you can use star six to mute and unmute. And if the meeting is by chance disrupted by an attendee, staff will temporarily mute all microphones and the meeting will resume once this uh, disruption has been removed. Um, I would like to, uh, before we ask uh, Rachel to call the roll, I would like to welcome, take this opportunity to welcome our newest board members. And uh, we had a week uh, of transition in this area. So I wanna first of all welcome Council Member Joe Marine from Mukilteo, representing the small, I'm sorry, representing the medium cities. And Joe is well versed on community transit business as he served on the board um, for quite some time in his previous time in elected office. Welcome back, Joe. And Council Member Sid Roberts of Stanwood, representing small cities. It's good to see Sid again. And Sid's also been active uh, in, as, uh, as in, a, in a role of alternate uh, in previous years. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And Medium Cities Board alternate, Mayor uh, Kyoto Atsumuto Wright, and I want to welcome her as well. It's great to have her as our Medium Cities Board alternate. With that, will the clerk please call the roll? Thank you. Council Member Kim Daughtry. Present. Council Member Joe Marine. Present. Thank you. Council Member Tom Merrill. Here. Thank you. Council Member Nate Nearing. Here. Thank you. Mayor John Nearing. Here. Thank you. Labor Representative Lance Norton. Lance, are you on the line? Council Member Sid Roberts. Here. Thank you. Council Member Jan Schwetti. Here. Thank you. Mayor Nicola Smith. Here. Thank you. Council Member Stephanie Wright. Council Member Wright. I thought I saw you join. Okay. And let me just, oh, here she comes. Uh, <laughs> just one moment, I see her coming in. Uh, we'll circle back to that. I think I also saw Lance Norton join. Lance, are you on the line? Do you wanna unmute your phone? The star six. Okay. And Council Member Wright, are you here? On? Here you are. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, Thank I'm you back. <laughs> Chair, we do have a quorum, uh, since I, but do I, since I do see some alternates on the line, I thought I would also call those names just so we could be aware of who's joined today. Uh, do, we have, do we have Council Member Mike Gallagher here? Council Member Laura Johnson? Present. Thank you. Council Member Kyoko Matsumoto Wright? Here. Thank you. Council Member Jared Mead? Uh, and Council Member James McNeil? Okay, that concludes roll chair, thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, so we do have at this portion of the meeting, a time we set aside for public comment, um, written and, and then of course uh, verbal. We did receive written comment from Mr. Joe Kunzler. And Mr. Kunzler is also signed up to speak. And so I'm going to open the floor. And uh, Mr. Kunzler, uh, you have the floor for your public comment. Thank you, sir. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good, I'm on live. Uh, I'll, make, I'll make this quick because I emailed in my, my primary comments and questions. Uh, first, I apologize for the poor video quality. Um, second, I um, 
submitted some written comments after I went over your budget notebook, and I'm going to ask that you really take a look at how 46 coach operators, free vehicle service workers, free mechanics, one assistant maintenance manager, and free instructors are not being hired or are being let go, but you're still adding executive positions. I just really question that logic because I don't see it in the document. Uh, Grant, uh, look, I'm, I'm not as smart as CEO Heath, who I told every transit, every council yesterday was very smart. Um, it's, woo, woo. Uh, okay. Um, apparently CEO Heath has some critics in the help, in the help desk, I'm sorry. Um, go, moving on. Um, you know, and I also asked how we can get that merger done with Ever Transit. I think that's got to be a priority. There was just a piece written by me published in today's Urbanist, the urbanist.org, uh, about this. Um, and I just think it needs to be a priority. Um, I also think we need a core services re review that kind of builds on my oral comments. I also want to raise fine, you know, a couple ideas for transit passes. First, I think every board member and every board alternate should get a ORCA pass. I think it's important to recognize the work that board members and board alternates do for the community, representing the community to community transit, because citizen activists like my, me may you know, have only three minutes to give public comment, but you're there at every meeting. You're there at these board committee meetings that I wish were open to observation. You're, you you work these long hours and you really hear the words thank you from transit dependent people like me who consider public transit our limbs. And I think it's important to say thank you. I was raised in a household where you didn't get dinner unless you said thank you for dinner. On that note, I don't know how much time I've got left, so let me know when I'm down to 30 seconds, please. But I really think we should also have a discussion about having disabled veterans and disabled first responders get a free transit pass. I think I understand public transit throughout the US is hit up very bad, and this is going to be a process. But I really think we also need to thank our military and our first responders for all they do. And I think at least saying to those with disability that need transit, it's free. You did your part. This is from people who, this is a gift for what you did to protect all of us and our ability to have these public conversations and have a functioning Republican democracy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And, and finally, uh, one last spare, you know, one last wild thought. Um, I would like it if we could crowdfund saying thank you to quite a few employees of community transit, not just CEO Heath. I'm a little wary of name dropping individual employees because it's a bad habit of mine. It has been communicated to me by multiple um, women in multiple transit agencies that it, be, that it is a bad habit. So I'm trying to work on that. Um, you can just say this was public comment calling for a serious look at the budget and for some social equity. And with that, I'd like to give back the microphone. And I want to thank you for this public comment opportunity and thank you for your service. Thank you, Mr. Kunstler. Appreciate uh, your comments this afternoon, both written and verbal. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak under public comment? Anyone at all? All right, we will close that portion of the meeting. And uh, we do have the need uh, right now to elect a board secretary to replace uh, Mike Todd, who um, is no longer in that position as he took on his new position at the city of Mill Creek. And so let me uh, go over a little bit of the business here to set the table for that. Board officers are elected, as you all probably know, uh, at the February board meeting each year, the positions uh, that are elected uh, for board officers include the position of chair, vice chair, and secretary, and they're all for one year term. With the departure of Mike Todd, the board um, will now elect a secretary for the remainder of that term, which would end on February 4th of 2021. Per the bylaws of community transit, um, the board secretary also serves on the executive committee along with the board chair, the vice chair, and the past chair. Nominations will be taken from the board, from the board, excuse me, any voting member of the board, including current officers, may be nominated. As a reminder, the uh, current officers are myself as chair and the vice chair, Kim Daughtry. Any board member can nominate board members and, and any board member myself nominate as well. 
voting members may vote or they may abstain. And uh, the person with the majority of votes will end up taking the position. And with that, I'll go ahead and open up the floor for nominations for the position of uh, board secretary. Yeah, John. Yes, go I ahead. Like to, I would like to uh, nominate Joe Maureen. Uh, he has been on the board before and even served as board chair. And with that experience, I think it would be really beneficial right now. Thank you. Do we have any other nominations? I would like Moore. to nominate Jan Schwitty. She's been on the board for quite a while, <laughs> been on most of the committees. I think she'd do well at uh, secretary. That was going to be my nomination, Kim. You beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any, yeah. other any other nominations? Okay. So we have two nominations on the floor. Um, and Rachel, I want to check, is it easiest to just uh, uh, do a, a voice vote, have everybody say who they're voting for or uh, on, the, on the Zoom call or what would be, since there's more than one nomination on the floor, what would be the easiest for you to track? Yes, uh, whichever you prefer, what you first recommended works for me. Okay. If you don't mind then going through the uh, board and we will um, go ahead and go that route. Mr. Chair, may I yeah. ask one question quickly beforehand? Uh, did both nominees accept the nomination? I just wanna make sure that both of them That's, did. Oh, point. yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, Council Member Maureen, do you accept? Uh, yeah, I accept. Thank you, Jan. Council Member Schwecki. Uh, yeah, well, I'm hesitating because I'm the one who nominated Joe, and uh, I would really like to see him get that. Um, can I ask and say thank you to Stephanie and Kim and maybe run again later? Is that permissible? Absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate your support. So for the record, are you withdrawing your nomination? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. I just encourage you to run next year when everybody shifts up a, a spot. That would be my only encouragement. And um, I will do that. Thank you, Stephanie. Excellent. Thanks, you guys. And sorry, John, I just thought that um, I wanted to make sure we had two full nominees. So thank you. No, I appreciate it. Uh, very good point. Um, well, with that, then I'm going to go ahead and just uh, ask for a voice vote. Um, we do have one nominee. That would be Councilmember Marine, and it was nominated by Councilmember Schwedy. And I'll go ahead and ask uh, for uh, all those in favor of Joe taking the board secretary position, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the motion passes unanimously and congratulations, Council Member Marine. And uh, welcome to the uh, executive committee. By the way, Joe, Joe, I don't know if you know this or not, but we changed after you left and the secretary actually has to do the minutes. <laughs> Jan, are you still interested? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, Say, uh, say thank you to Council Member Schwedy very much. And, and and full disclosure, I did uh, call Jan before the meeting because I wanted to make sure that um, I certainly, it, yeah, she, she deserves it. And, you know, if she wanted to do that, I, I would not have, it, I wouldn't have done it. So so thank you very much, uh, Council Member Schwedy. I appreciate it. Well, that's great. Now that we have our new board secretary and two new board members, um, I'll go ahead and fill the existing vacancies on the standing committees. So you can expect a revised list of that uh, prior to the November committee meeting. And with that, we'll go to our CEO and have the uh, have his uh, chief executive officer's report. Emmett, go ahead. All right. Thank you, uh, Chair Nearing. Uh, well, let me start by offering my congratulations to Council Member Marine. Um, it was mentioned that he's 
previously served in a leadership cycle on our board, including two years, I believe, two consecutive years as chair. I think um, it'll be great uh, entering the, the new year and the CEO transition with um, a very, very strong executive uh, committee leading the board. I feel very reassured um, knowing that executive committee will be there. And Jan, as always, thank you very much for your willingness to serve and, and uh, good luck to you with nominations and elections next year. Um, well, we have two new board members. Mayor Nearing acknowledged that. I'm very pleased to have council members Maureen and uh, Roberts join us. Uh, council member Roberts as well, of course, has served on our board before uh, as a representative from the city of Linwood. So uh, I've been a strong advocate for transportation, very familiar with our agency and our board. And I think uh, additionally adds a lot of strength to the board going forward. And Mayor um, from Mount Lake Terrace, Kyoko Matsumoto Wright is uh, with us as well. Uh, the mayor has shown a lot of interest in serving on our board repeatedly. Very pleased that she was able to break in in an alternate position for Midside Cities um, from the city of Mount Lake Terrace, but representing Midside Cities. So, um, Council Member Kyoko, welcome. Uh, with that, uh, for my report today, I want to just provide a little bit of uh, uh, setup for three presentations that you'll see today. I'm actually, uh, I was thinking in the run up to this meeting, I was actually feeling very excited to share this information with you. Our agency has a lot of very important initiatives underway, and I think you'll very much enjoy three presentations today. Uh, the first one is our 2021 proposed budget. It'll be introduced by our director of administration, Jerry Beardsley, and our budget manager, Mary Albert, will uh, present the budget to you. With some new members on the board, I wanted uh, however, to make it make clear, uh, our normal process is to uh, introduce this proposed budget to the board today and invite question and answers uh, for any clarifications that you need on the proposal. Today then uh, starts the deliberation period where the board can ask questions, get answers. You'll have an opportunity for further deliberation at your November regular meeting. Any question answered by any board meeting in this process will be answered and copied to all board members. And then we'll be asking uh, for you to take action on a proposed budget at your December meeting. Um, so the intent today is not a lot of Q&A uh, about the rationale in the budget, but rather uh, clarity on what the proposal is uh, and then kicking off deliberations. After that, you're going to see I, I, what I think is a very interesting presentation about our dial of ride transit or DART service. Uh, DART service is provided to citizens uh, in our service area who have disabilities that prevent them from using our mainline services. Uh, it's a very important service to that community that has been provided by Homage Senior Services for uh, the past several decades. Actually, they have been our only provider of DART services. We've recently transitioned to a new vendor. We have a few weeks experience under our belt now. And uh, Roland Behe and uh, his staff, Margaret Keckler from our contracted services division are gonna give you an update on how the transition to a new vendor has gone and, and what the reaction is with our customers to this uh, new service, new service provider. And lastly, you'll see a presentation from our manager of regional programs and projects. I wanna point out that um, Melissa Colley has recently been promoted to fill that position. Uh, you all know um, uh, Melissa quite well. She's uh, served as our grants manager and she's had plenty of audiences before this board, but I wanted to let you know that I was very pleased and very proud that um, Melissa competed in an open recruitment selection process and was selected to fill this a uh, higher level position and is now leading um, several of our regional programs, but notably the build out of our bus rapid transit system. And she'll be briefing you on the status of that network build out today. Also, uh, I, wanna, I wanna just make sure to mention that <clears throat> Melissa reports to June Duvall and a, a deputy director for planning and development. Our agency, uh, in spite of COVID resulting in some reductions to our operating services, 
we still were able to maintain a $278 million capital program that's outlined in our transit development plan. June's responsible for oversight of that, our entire capital program. Um, and the great majority, almost all of that $278 million of funded investment that needs to be delivered on scope, schedule, and budget over the next six years. Um, <clears throat> you otherwise would not hear from June. She stays backstage. She lets other people in her group uh, do the presentations and take the spotlight. But I want you to know that June plays a very uh, critical leadership role working with Roland as Deputy Director of Planning and Development. Uh, taken together, I hope you get a lot of insight into the activities behind the scenes uh, that result in the services that you see on the street. And with that, I will turn it back to uh, Mayor Nearing and he can, uh, he can kick off the first presentation on the 2021 budget. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Appreciate it, CEO Heath. And uh, with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Director Beardsley and see if you have some comments you would like to make to kick this off. And if you and your team would uh, move forward with your presentation, we're looking forward to it. Great. Thank you. I, I'm excited about this, too. Um, so thank you for your time today. This gives us a chance to do a little more in-depth presentation about the budget than we typically do uh, in a regular board meeting. So really appreciate your time for the workshop today. And what I wanted to do is just give you a little bit of context about the preparation of the budget. Mary's going to get into the details of the budget itself, but just thinking back to last year, you know, we hold a workshop like this every, every fall. Um, and who would have guessed that as you were acting on the 2021, 2020 budget, so much would have changed. You know, COVID wasn't on our radar at that time. Um, and so I started to think, well, that's bad, but honestly, this budget, I'm so proud of. Uh, we are humble and thankful that we have the revenue coming in the way we thought we would. Uh, we are very, very thankful for the CARES Act funding that has helped us this year and will help us a little bit next year as well. Um, and maybe even more importantly than that, what I wanted to say is that more so even than other years, I think this budget development has been very inclusive and transparent. And just a few examples of that. Um, we, we increased our briefings about the financial situation in 2020, but also 2021 and for our six year transit development plan. That led to regular monthly briefings for our finance committee, our executive committee, the full board. Uh, a number of us participated with Emmett in both live and taped employee uh, Q&A sessions. So our employees, I think, were also able to see some of the choices and strategies we had in terms of responding to the situation and planning for 2021. Um, we, we actually, I think, involved more of our employees in our departments as we looked for ways to implement those strategies. And we were meeting with the labor representatives more frequently and more often than in past years. And really that had a lot to do with the safety of our customers and our employees. Um, but all of that work ahead of time really helped to feed into what you're going to see here in the proposed budget. Um, and so while Mary gets into the details, I really just wanted to leave you with those thoughts that we really uh, feel that we've uh, come together to give you a budget that's stable, sustainable in the long term, and continues to prioritize our employee safety and our customer safety and experience. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. So we've been looking forward to reviewing the proposed 2021 budget with you. As Jerry stated, uh, we're presenting you with a budget that is or provides safety, stability, and sustainability. Uh, so this year's budget takes a more conservative look at expenditures, and it really sets community transit up for continuous growth. Uh, we are positioned uh, for future service expansion, um, and this budget continues the goal of building organizational capacity and engaging our customers. And I really wanted to thank all of our employees, especially those in finance and administration, but also employees across the organization. Um, who put together many elements of this budget. It truly is a team effort to put this together. Next slide, please. So this is a um, 
just a blueprint of where we're going to go in this presentation. Uh, our goal is to get through the content in about 30 minutes so that you have time for Q&A. I also wanted to point out to you the budget notebooks that you have this year in PDF format. Um, they're virtually the same as the hard copy that you've had in past years. The difference is you have a clickable table of contents and bookmarks that should basically help you get to the same sections that you would have with hard copy tabs. Um, I also wanted to call your attention to the CEO message and to the executive summary. If you are limited for time, these would be good places to start. You'll get a pretty good synopsis if you review these. But we, of course, would love to see you read the department sections and hear about our department's accomplishments and their priorities for 2021. Um, and then we also have great content about statistics, agency information, and our performance indicators. Next slide, please. Some of you have seen this graphic before. This is the blueprint for how our business planning cycle runs. We are currently in that right hand box with the green label. This is the process our annual budget where we allocate our resources to our operations, strategic priorities, capital projects, and we also make sure that we're well reserved. Uh, next slide, please. We also start our budget process with a list of goals. Uh, these are very similar goals to previous years. In previous years, number five would have been to plan for a potential economic downturn. Um, this year, we got the opportunity, if I can call it that, to actually um, try to address and uh, take measures to mitigate the pandemic-related uh, downturn. Um, our budget development also focused on increasing public perception of transit as a safe option for travel. Uh, we also want to rebuild and to increase our ridership and to show that we provide service options that are adapting to the changing needs of the transportation marketplace. Next slide, please. So now we'll go through um, the various components of our budget. I also wanted to mention that at the bottom left-hand corner of most of the slides, there will be a reference to a section in the budget notebook. So if you have additional questions about the particular section or you just wanna take a deeper dive, you can go to that section. You can also ask us questions as well. Um, our service hours are following what we call our flow recovery scenario. So during the process, particularly early on, we looked at two different bookends for both our economic projections as well as our service hours. We looked at a more, a more rapid recovery approach. What if the best possible scenario happened? And we looked at a slower recovery approach as well. So we really wanted some flexibility we wanted to be able to plan conservatively so that we would be prepared for a slower recovery, but we also wanted a quick recovery scenario in our back pockets in the event that our revenues rebound quicker than we had hoped. So that was why we created two scenarios. Um, during this year, we landed on an 85% uh, service level, and that's 85% from the base level that we started off on in March. Uh, so we're looking at about 595,000 service hours in our current year, uh, going to 578,000 in 2021. Uh, with modest increases until we get to 2024 with the rollout of the orange line. Our ridership uh, was humming along just fine until 2020. We had modest growth. This year, we don't have specific projections for you yet. Our planning department continues to work with their outside consultant on ridership projections. Next slide, please. 
For 2021, we're projecting about 183 million in revenues. This is a decrease of over 15% from the current year. Sales tax, so if you look at that middle pie in the, the graphic, sales tax is now about 66% of our total operating revenue. In prior years, it usually ranged from about oh, 71 to 72%. With the planned or the expected reduction in sales tax, we expect it to go to about two thirds of our total operating revenues. Um, fares are also decreasing and other revenues will be close to 20% of our total. And of other revenues consist of sound transit reimbursements. That's reimbursement for community transit delivering sound transit service. Uh, Interfund revenues are pretty solid this time around. Those result from capital projects that are completed where we are returning revenue back to the general fund. And interest income is also decreasing. The feds have lowered the prime rate to zero to a quarter percent. So our interest income has, um, has shrunk since um, 2019. Also, we used to have a little slice there for advertising revenue. It's now grown or I should say decreased to a small slice and is included in other. On the right side, we have our grant revenues that we record in the operating fund. Our federal grant revenues include some CARES Act billing. We expect to bill about $6 million for the CARES Act in 2021. 20, about 27 million will be billed out by the end of 2020. Next slide, please. So this graphic gives you a good idea of what our bookends look like. That green line at the very top of the graph, that was what our budget and TDP looked like last year. So when the 2020 budget was adopted, we thought we were gonna get $154 million in sales tax in 2020, increasing to 160 and 167 million over the next two years. So our, our higher bookend, our rapid recovery, estimates 149 million this year, going to about 143 million in 2021. And then the slow recovery estimates 139 million this year, uh, dropping to 122 million or just shy of 122 million next year. Now we have put that re slow recovery model into our forecast and into our budget, it is actually looking like for 2020 that our sales tax will be collected more in line with the rapid recovery. However, we have not looked at changing our budget to reflect the rapid recovery just yet. With possible additional Boeing layoffs, with Boeing moving service, with um, fairly high unemployment in Snohomish County and uncertainty over additional federal stimulus and how much unemployment compensation our, our community will have access to next year. We're really just not certain that we're going to follow a more rapid recovery scenario. So for the time being, we're sticking with the conservative version. Next slide, please. This slide gives a historic look at our sales tax and then a future look. Many of you may know about Proposition 1, which was the sales tax or the initiative for community transit passed in 2015. There was some legislation written during the course of that year that allowed community transit to take to the, to the people um, a vote on an additional three tenths of a percent sales tax. Fortunately for community transit, 
Proposition 1 passed in November of 2015. And then in 2016, we saw an increase in our sales tax. So we're seeing um, a pretty solid upward trajectory in those collections from 2017 through 2019. Our mid-year forecast was more like 138 million and we're projecting a decrease to 121 and a half, maybe 122 next year. Uh, that decrease is based on um, projections by the Puget Sound Economic Forecaster, which we use for some of our economic data. Our historic sales tax growth rate over the course of about 30 years has been an average of 4% or slightly more. So for, for planning purposes, um, barring additional information, we tend to stick with a 4%. Next slide, please. Um, this graph shows our fair revenues and um, fair box recovery rate. Our fares were humming right along through 2019. Um, this year in March and April, we saw a large drop in our ridership. And that really had to do with our rider and driver safety with the governor's stay home, stay safe order or stay home, stay healthy order. So we hit a low point in um, boardings in April, followed by um, the, the discontinuance of fair box collections for several months. So really our focus this year rather on fair recovery is on keeping our riders and our drivers as safe as possible. We do expect ridership to increase substantially when this pandemic starts to wind down. Also noteworthy, our planning department is working on a fair study with an outside consultant that will give us some assistance in understanding our ridership once Link Light Rail comes on board, um, as well as what our future ridership patterns will look like and what our fair um, configuration should be. Next slide, please. So I've gone over our revenues, but I wanted to show you what our revenues fund. Our operating revenues, as you've seen, consist of sales tax, fares, and some other revenues. That box in the middle is operations, and that's what we fund with our operating revenues first and foremost. After that, we take care of debt service and workers comp. Uh, we have a small debt issue outstanding from 2017 that was used to purchase buses. So we ensure that that payment is made as well as our um, workers comp funding to a rather conservative level that our actuaries um, estimate for us. When that is funded, we fund our operating, our capital, uh, replacement um, and facilities and technology funding. Uh, once we've we, excuse me, once we've funded our reserves, then we fund our capital program, which is also funded by capital grant revenues, not just operating. Next slide, please. Most years, our cost containment strategies focus on our cost per service hour growth. This year, we really focused on creating a sustainable operating expense structure. Uh, we needed to accommodate a pandemic adjusted service plan and right size uh, our operating budget to fit that. Our big areas of focus have been um, our direct labor costs, that's been done through voluntary retirements, voluntary layoffs, furloughs, and we've also frozen a number of administrative positions. We've deferred service expansion, and we've also ceased uh, to have employees travel or go to offsite trainings in favor of utilizing our e-learning system as well as webinars. So um, we've kept people safe and saved on travel costs. Next slide, please. Our total general fund expenditures 
for 2021 are budgeted, budgeted at almost 198 million. So if you look at the operating expense, department operating expense side on the left, we are actually decreasing by about $14 million. That equates to about uh, over 9% of our department operating expense budgets. The transfers to other funds are increasing. That really includes um, funding, well, reserves for future BRT projects. Those are, those are funds that will be held in reserve in our technology and facilities fund. Next slide, please. Here is a greater snapshot of our department operating expense. Our wages and benefits are going down by about $6 million. That, that really results from having fewer FTEs. That also means fewer benefits and payroll taxes. We're additionally getting some savings in our employer PERS contribution. Our purchase transportation costs are decreasing as well based on contractual hours that will be delivered next year, as well as um, there will be no uh, pandemic premiums in the transportation costs next year. Another noteworthy area in our budget is our fuel costs. Some of you have followed our diesel fuel reports pretty closely. We're averaging roughly $1.40 a gallon for diesel fuel. So we've reduced our fuel budget substantially. Last year, we budgeted two and a quarter per gallon for diesel. This year, we're budgeting $1.75 for diesel. Unless global travel picks up, we will probably see continued lower fuel prices. We still do have a fuel reserve as well. And then our parts and supplies area will also decrease. When we deliver fewer service hours, that means that buses need to be fixed at a slightly lower rate. Next slide, please. One of the ways we look at our staffing is using what we call the NTD report. That's our National Transit Database grant report that community transit has to be, has to submit to the Federal Transit Administration annually for grant consideration. So our employees are categorized for that report by four different categories. And we try to maintain a consistent split between the different categories. We try not to um, go out of balance based on those percentages. Next slide. The 2020 forecast has been adjusted down by 45 FTEs from 2019, and we're increasing by a single FTE in 2021. Next slide, please. Our capital budget for 2021 is 96 million. Uh, more than two thirds of that budget is carryover capital as opposed to new projects. One thing I did wanna point out with capital projects, when we approve and request funding for a capital project, we request that the project is funded and budgeted in its entirety. We carry over those projects then from year to year until they are completed. Next slide. This is another snapshot of our capital budget. For 2021, our facilities projects represent our largest category, followed by technology systems and then revenue vehicles. In some years, revenue vehicles might be the largest or second largest category. Next slide. And then here is a list of our major 2021 new capital projects. Next slide. So this is what everybody is waiting for. What is our projected cash in the operating fund? We will be starting out the year with 
a higher than projected cash because we are receiving about 27 million in CARES Act funds in 2020. Those were, um, yeah, those were beyond expectation. So we'll be starting out pretty strong with 120 million. Our revenues will exceed our expenses by about $14 million. We tightened our belts to make sure that we could fit our expenses well within revenues. Um, we'll transfer out almost 39 million of that cash into other funds for projects and for reserves, but we'll be bringing back some from our capital projects funds uh, from completed projects. So our ending cash is projected to be about 106 million and change, but we do set aside 23.2 million for operating reserve. And this year we'll have 1.75 million for fuel reserve. That will cover us in the event that fuel prices really do go up to um, $2.25 per gallon um, and the gas prices also go up. So that leaves us with um, $81.6 million for capacity for sustainability and expansion. And we do plan that out for funding future service and expansion in our six year transit development plan. Next slide, please. So all funds together, we project about $180 million at the end of 2021. And this is predominantly um, statutorily required reserves or else it is industry best practices. Um, we keep a small balance in our, or we build a small balance in our debt service fund or our bond fund, um, just enough to pay for our bond payment annually. Um, and again, we have an operating reserve and a fuel reserve in our operating fund. Next slide, please. So we're coming back to our goals. We believe that we have achieved all of these goals in our 2021 budget. We've in, we're increasing our public perception of transit as a safe option in this budget. We're working toward rebuilding and increasing our ridership. And we're also looking to provide service options that adapt to the changing needs of the market. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to give you a schedule of what's next with the budget. On November 5th, we'll have a public hearing. That's when members of the public can come forward and give their comments. There also is a budget mailbox that um, the community can send comments to as well. At that time, you may have formulated some questions about the budget once you've read through the notebook. You can email those questions to me or to Jerry. You can give us a call with those questions. Um, we are going to be putting together your questions in a document and formally presenting those to the Finance Performance and Oversight Committee on the 19th. So we are hoping to get everybody's questions by the 13th, so we can do that. And then our target date for you to approve the budget is December 3rd uh, with um, deadline for board approval. Uh, on December 31st. Next slide. Does anybody have questions? Jerry and I can take your questions at this time. Could I ask just a clarification? Yes. Okay, on page nine on fair revenues, uh, from 2014, the um, Total fares go up, but the fare box recovery rate goes down. I was just curious as to why. Um, Mary, do you want me to? You can go ahead, yes. Okay. Um, 
so the the fare box recovery is not really tied so much to the actual fare and the revenue, but more about how we control and contain our costs. So uh, it would be a reflection of what we were doing kind of behind the scenes to make sure that we were um, containing costs. So even if the fares go up, we, we may be um, making other decisions behind the scenes. And Mary, I don't know if you want to pull that slide up, but that's probably what we're looking at. Okay. okay. Rachel, do you want to bring that back? For uh, some of you board members who, who may be uh, newer on the board, the fare box recovery rate is uh, fundamentally intended to indicate uh, how much of the cost of a, of a ride is subsidized. Um, it's, so it's really a measure of fares as a percent of uh, operating expense. Um, so in our case, if you get to those numbers, you know, well, yeah, go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, Rachel. No, no, go ahead, Emmett. You're doing great. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll stop with that. Um, the, the number indicates the percent of the cost of the ride that is uh, subsidized to the rider. So. Um. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I have yes. a question. Uh, okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. That's right. Uh, so two things. One, um, if I could have Rachel send me a copy of the budget for whatever, if it was sent, I don't know where it is. Um, and it's very possible it wasn't because obviously I just recently got on the board. Uh, but the but the question I have is remembering when we were going through the issues with the downturn in the economy, uh, we had gotten to a point where we had an opportunity to kind of lock in a fuel price, kind of a hedging, if I recall. Mm -hmm. And does that make any sense to look at it now while the price is low? Um, obviously, if it goes down, that's not a good thing. If, it, if, if we lock in the, and hedge that price, if it goes up, right. that's a great thing. So uh, have we been doing anything with that? Um, that's a great it's a great question. Just yesterday, I was talking to our procurement manager about fuel hedging. And really, the time to be looking at that is as prices start to go up, which we are not seeing and are not predicting in the future. It's something that we always have on our radar screen, but um, but we are expecting... Um, the prices to stay low. And so what this board has been doing for the past several years is to put aside a reserve for fuel. Um, it was in some of the slides that Mary was talking about so that if fuel prices change, we have that uh, capacity to, to go back and have reserved funds. We have yet to need to dip into that though. Mm -hmm. What I wanted I would, to say- uh, if, I, if I may, I would also add for, again, for people who didn't live through that period, uh, when we were exercising fuel hedges, it was not our purpose to try to game the market and um, you know, buy, buy low. Mm -hmm. um, we used a hedge in order to lock in budget certainty. So we, we would know what our cost was. The hedge would make sure that that cost was uh, durable. So, I mean, the, the price being low now, if, if you're thinking the thought of a hedge is, is try to lock in now while the price is low, we have intentionally stayed away from strategies that try to anticipate the market and, and, and game it either high or low. Mm -hmm. I was just going to mention that the, the type of fuel hedge that we um, purchased at that time was more like an insurance policy. Um, so we were paying out a fairly substantial fee every year and truly our fuel price would have had to increase substantially to actually draw on that. We would have had to have seen catastrophic increases. Um, at some point we decided that it was not financially reasonable to continue that, but I think it's something that we could look at again in the next few years, especially as the economy bounces back. Mayor Neary, may I make one more comment about the fares? Yeah, go ahead. 
Um, I just because the slide is up and it it looks so dramatic, I just want to remind the board members that in 2020 we did suspend fares for some time, consistent with other transit agencies. So if you're looking at that decline and wondering uh, what the heck is going on, just remember that we had a pretty dramatic uh, and immediate change in our ridership and in our fare collection. Thank you. This might be kind of fun in, in the interest of institutional history and trivia. If I'm not mistaken, it may have been Council Member Marine back in the mid 2000s who uh, for the first time suggested to us that we explore fuel hedging. And uh, that did mm -hmm. result in us moving to uh, our first fuel hedging activities. So full circle there, Council Member Marine. <laughs> Why do we always seem to get involved right when the economy is going down? Bad penny theory. <laughs> you can ask Mayor Nearing about that. <laughs> um, I have a question. Yeah, go uh, ahead, Councilman Merrill. Uh, as we looked at the recovery on sales tax out into future years, are we getting any sort of um, counseling guidance from consultants and others on what the effect coming out of our current um, recession in terms of the loss of brick and mortar as people turn more and more to online and whether or not we will actually see our 4% recovery? Um, we don't specifically engage uh, a consultant, but we do get economic information from the Puget mm -hmm. Sound Economic Forecaster. I'm a regular reader and subscriber to that publication, and um, we've occasionally um, spoken with their staff about what some of the, the impacts will be. Um, this is kind of new territory, so there's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, one of the things that's been really fortunate for us, and again, another new thing from the pandemic, is that the chief financial officers and budget officers from the um, regional agencies have been meeting regularly during this pandemic to make sure that if we have information or are making some assumptions about fares or sales tax revenue assumptions, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, that we are all coordinated. That doesn't mean that we're all exactly the same because there are still some regional and local differences, but um, it's it's been a really good group. And some of those are engaging consultants. And so while we're not doing that yet, we certainly have access to them through those other agencies. And your question was specifically about online retail sales. So with sales tax sourcing, the sales tax that a person remits goes to the locality in which they live. So if I purchase um, something online, it probably goes to um, Arlington. It, the, the retail, uh, so Amazon has to, has to collect and remit my sales tax to the jurisdiction that I live in, not where they shipped it from or some other place. And that's a change from about 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, and staff, does that did that complete everything you wanted to say, uh, Director Bridgley? Yeah, that's uh, again. Appreciate your time. Great job, Mary and team putting the budget together. Happy to answer other questions if you want to email or or give us a call. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation mm -hmm. and the start of the process here. And of course, we have the calendar now to. And uh, please do email if you have questions uh, mm -hmm. regarding the budget. Mm -hmm. That brings us to our DART paratransit service update. And uh, Director Behe will introduce our speaker. Yeah, thank you. Um, as Emmett shared earlier, we've just undertaken a successful transition of our DART ADA paratransit service to a new provider um, just within the last few weeks here. And um, feeling was that today was a really good opportunity to provide the board with more details on the scope of services that we're offering under this contract and also to introduce TransDev, uh, the new DART service provider. 
I'm going to introduce Margaret Keckler, who's assistant manager in our contracted services area uh, with direct oversight of the DART contract. And um, just to note that Margaret was really the driving force that kept the process moving forward uh, on drafting an updated request for proposal, securing the successful vendor and ensuring a, a smooth transition um, really over the past several months and then particularly um, as we approached uh, October. Margaret would also be quick to say that she was strongly supported by her team, um, which includes Wade Mahala, Manager of Contracted Services, Christina Gruber, uh, Budget and Data Analyst, Kunjan Dial, our Manager of Procurement, and then as Emmett mentioned earlier, June Duvall, um, Deputy Director of Planning and Development. They also had a large supporting cast across the agencies, so just wanted to acknowledge everybody um, that contributed to this effort. Uh, when Margaret's done with her presentation, uh, she will also introduce members uh, of the TransDev team um, who are on the call today as well. So uh, with that, Margaret, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. All right. Can everybody see the screen? All right. The, um, get this, there we go. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 requires public transit agencies to provide paratransit services and, um, that extended the reach of the um, the Act of 1973, which uh, private companies then were the only ones uh, providing. Excuse me, <clears throat> only private companies provided transportation to the disabled com community. Now the three quarter mile is what we call the ADA corridor. And that's the paratransit destinations that are within three quarter miles of our fixed route service. That's what that map depicts. DART is an origin to destination service, meaning we pick a client up and take them directly to where they want to go. Senior services of Snohomish uh, was the first to have, as we stated earlier, the first to get the contract in 1991. And in 2018, they changed their name to Homage Senior Services. And although they no longer have the paratransit contract, Homage will continue to be a valued partner in our community. DART provided approximately 191,000 trips in 2019 to over 6,700 registered guests. Now in January, it was decided that a new RFP for our paratransit service was necessary. And our agency met this challenge given a very sporty timeline and together as an agency guided by the core team, as Roland stated, of June Duvall, Kunjan Dale, Wade Mahela, Christina Gruber and myself, um, we delivered this heavy lift in 59 days. Um, that's, that was quite the, um, the achievement for our agency. And we were able to step and pivot to address the goals and priorities that we've defined in the RFP of value, safety, ADA compliance, quality service and customer satisfaction, efficiency and teamwork. Every department has had a connection to this service. Uh, procurement shepherded the RFP along and made the process really easy. And moving forward, vehicle maintenance will inspect our vehicles on a regular basis to assure our assets are safe and um, uh, protected. Customer experience provides better visibility of our guest journey through our connections database. Marketing and communications continues to support um, the development of our DART webpage is now directly tied into the community transit web pages. And employee engagement provides policy compliance, safety and training support and partner to provide a safe environment for our employees, our contract employees and our guests. Finance contributes procedures for fair counting 
and planning and contracted services will keep the service smooth by providing operational oversight and contract compliance. Bottom line, DART is a service owned by the entire agency. So let's meet our contractor, TransDev the Mobility Company. They're based near Chicago and they're the largest private sector operator of multiple modes of transit in North America, including bus, rail, streetcar, shuttle, and of course, paratransit. They're a leading global operator in 17 countries and on five continents. TransDev provides passengers every day the freedom to get where they want to be into the and connect with what they find important in their community. Their offices are located right next door to MCOB, so we will get to see the DART vehicles come and go much more often now. So some of the exciting new things that we will see is uh, TransDev is providing a full turnkey IT solution. Uh, that's more efficient scheduling and improved on-time performance. We're going to be seeing in the near future the My Transit app that enhances the customer experience by allowing the customer to, to do some self-management of their trips. They'll be able to uh, see where their bus is. Uh, they'll be able to uh, get notifications when the bus is ready to arrive. And that's really important. Um, our TAC members had stated in the past that that was really important for our users. And that's going to be rolling out in the next month or so. Our on-demand KPI dashboards are provided to us um, in contracted services with uh, daily reports. And that helps us manage the uh, the service and kind of get um, a more visibility to what's going on and to help our customers um, get, get what they deserve in the service. Drivers have also seen improved routing through the enhanced mobile data, mobile data terminals that use Google technology um, mapping much like you see on your cell phone. Now, as I said earlier, the commitment to our customer continues as the new tools help us to achieve better on-time performance, which is really important to our customers. The customer now sees familiar faces because TransDev hired many of the homage drivers. TransDev watches major platforms for comments such as Twitter and Facebook, as well as our own customer comment database. And they're going to be providing us a report that shows us exactly what the community is saying about our service. We will also soon see a mystery rider program. Individuals who ride the service uh, will grade different aspects of the service and give a report back, um, kind of a secret rider, a uh, secret shopper, if you will. That report will, will rate um, the different offerings and you know, how, how are they greeted, how is their service, um, and did they meet community transit expectations as well as transdev expectations. And that's going to be really important because we will see what the service is like, how it's operating directly from a guest perspective. TransDev safety program is geared to provide um, improved safety performance and lowered preventable accidents. Included with their staff is a dedicated safety and training manager. And we're excited to utilize DriveCam. Uh, DriveCam is a camera system that records driver behavior. And if something needs correction, uh, we can immediately see that and make those counseling and corrections. Now, before service started, uh, we toured the new TransDev facility and in their break room, they had probably a 12 foot by four foot banner um, that included their safety message. And that perfect safety day is their safety message. And Ron Bushman, who's the vice president of operations, he was there on site kicking off the service. And he asked each one of us, Roland, June, Wade and myself, to join with them in that commitment and sign the banner and as a top-down message that, um, you know, we want you to be safe. And that was showing their commitment 
to this important safety message. And our partnership and safety had begun that day. As part of this contract, maintenance is fully provided by TransDev. They don't rely on contract maintenance providers uh, and they've set up their shop in the face of the delays of COVID. Um, they're able to, because of their size, able to borrow resources from other sites that are either contracting uh, service or um, changing in different ways. They were able to go to these different sites of theirs and bring the equipment that we needed for our startup back up so we could start service. They are a lean site. They've had their experts walking the maintenance shop to find waste and build efficiencies into their maintenance processes. As well, they provide some ASE training to their mechanics um, that keeps them up to date on new technologies and new techniques to keep our equipment in tip top shape. So as I said earlier, our customer care department will be more involved because we now have better visibility of our dark customer's journey earlier. We now provide the intake of all customer comments through the connections database and complete research is conducted and the customer receives a response according to their preferred method, either by phone or email. And of course we have service level agreements um, both with TransDev and with our customer care department to um, meet those deadlines so they get a prompt response. We're working with TransDev and identifying areas where we can improve and we'll develop solutions to make our customer's journey safer and more enjoyable. So what's next? Well, contracted services will monitor service and check for contract compliance look for areas of improvement and work with our partner to develop these plans to improve our service and processes. So in summary, partnering with a seasoned contractor backed by global experience, new technology increases system performance. Community Transit's customer care team has had an active role in the dark customer experience. Safety is priority number one. And tools to make paratransit travel is made easy for all. And we will get our customers from where they are to where they want to be. So are there any questions? Any questions on this? Okay. Melissa, thank you for that. I Yes, Emmett. Mayor, may go I? Ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Emmett. Thanks. Um, just one, uh, one additional comment. Um, Amage Senior Services, um, their CEO, Steve McGraw, has been a close uh, professional colleague with myself and with Mayor Smith in Linwood. Uh, Mayor Smith had asked a few times during this process, and I wanted to, uh, to tell you that the um, we, we couldn't have had closer cooperation between Homage as our former provider, TransDev as our new provider and our own staff. Uh, TransDev uh, told us that, uh, that the transition from one vendor to another in this case was about as smooth and, and cooperative and collaborative as they've ever seen uh, in this kind of transition. Well, Mayor Smith, I wanted to assure you that um, it was just an outstanding experience working with CEO Steve McGraw at Homage and that relationship, I think is even enhanced uh, as a result of this transition. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for that, you. Emmett. And I would like to um, introduce, if there's no further questions, yeah, Ron, Ron Bushman, who's the operation, Vice President of Operations, and he has with him Rafe Herder, who's the Area Vice President, Sean Powers, who's the Vice President of Business Development, and Scott Foreman, who is our local face, uh, the General Manager of TransDev. Ron? Welcome. Thanks again for the presentation. Um, that will move us then back to Director Behe. I believe we're going to have a BRT, uh, quick BRT update. 
uh, Chair Nearing, I think that uh, Mr. Bushman was trying to make a comment and he was uh, muted, so we might want to let him have a chance. Oh, was he? Okay, go ahead. Mr. I'm sorry about that. I was just uh, on mute talking away. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, I do want to second uh, what Mr. Heath said that uh, homage was very gracious. Um, a lot of times we're, we're exchanging contracts with other private contractors that are competitors. And, and they were just very gracious in, in assisting us. So I, I do want to thank them for that and thank uh, your local staff. Uh, they've been great to work with. And, uh, and we have uh, had a successful transition and uh, I, I look forward to many years in partnering with your organization. So uh, anything we can do, please reach out, reach out to us. So we're here to help. Thank you. I'd like to offer my thanks to the TransDev uh, team as well. I'll regret not having the opportunity to overlap a little longer and develop the relationship, but uh, I'm sure you'll have a long successful relationship with my successor and with our agency. So. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think that's all. So back to you, Director B, to introduce uh, um, your next uh, uh, staff member that will be presenting. Okay. Thank you, Chair Nearing. Uh, as Emmett noted earlier, uh, Melissa Cawley has recently been promoted to manager of regional programs and projects. Um, Melissa is a familiar face to the board. Uh, her portfolio includes oversight over our um, development and implementation of the SWIFT BRT network. And we're underway with a lot of building activity in this program. A number of key milestones for funding and construction are gonna be coming up in the next year. And Melissa's presentation provides an overview on status of that program and then looks ahead to provide the long-term network vision that we're building toward with SWIFT. This will be important context um, as we bring uh, to the board um, some of these initiatives and as we make adjustments to other services, uh, integrate with Link Light Rail and continue to expand the SWIFT network. I would say also, Melissa would be quick to um, remind that this work is a close collaboration with Christopher Siliero, who's our BRT program manager, um, and also a talented project team supporting them. So um, with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Melissa for her presentation. Thank you, Roland. I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to share with uh, the board um, the growth of our SWIFT network and the vision we have moving forward. Um, teenagers and dogs have been silenced in my house, but I just had to move rooms. So hopefully we're gonna be smooth going. Next slide, please, Rachel. So uh, I just wanted to start with a refresh of what SWIFT actually is. I know we have some new board members. Many of our board members have been with us almost from the beginning of the inception of SWIFT, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about how uh, SWIFT came to be at Community Transit. Next slide, Rach. So uh, we really started with um, some design principles at the inception of SWIFT um, way back 2006, 2007 to help really guide us and create a foundation as we move forward, especially now that we're in design of our third line of SWIFT. It's been really good to have these design principles in place. You can see them on the screen. Uh, I'm not gonna go through them in detail, but just a good reminder of the things that help provide SWIFT um, to be fast, frequent, and reliable. Things like a 10 second dwell. One of the things that uh, if, if you're from one of our local jurisdictions that has a SWIFT line is, a uh, big topic is in lane stops. So we don't want to be in a pull out where we get stuck and the bus can't get back into the lane so we can maintain the speed of the service. Um, and also uh, uh, of note to jurisdictions is the fact that we need a three lane profile in order to operate SWIFT. Um, the other great thing about having these design principles and June in her infinite wisdom um, really sync these up with what the FTA defines bus rapid transit to be. And that made us eligible, if you remember, for that significant capital investment grant for the SWIFT Green Line, $43 million. Uh, to be eligible for that funding, we needed to meet this criteria of what the FTA called bus rapid transit and these design principles synced right up with that. Next, please. So a picture is a thousand words. I know I'm really biased, but I really think that we have a beautiful uh, system. Um, I think uh, this is a station design uh, mock-up that we're working on right now for the Swift Orange line. 
One of the things that uh, we incorporated in Green Line, went back and retrofitted Blue Line, and then we're incorporating obviously in Orange Line is that band at the top of the iconic marker so that people know what line they're riding on. It's not just Blue Line anymore. And then also our buses uh, with those three doors that folks can board from. And um, it just, it highlights the really uh, great features that Swift has. Next slide, please. So a little bit about how SWIFT works. It's really designed to be a different kind of bus service to be very distinctive. Uh, it's frequent. So I think most of you know that our buses operate uh, every 10 minutes, a bus comes to the station uh, during the weekdays on evenings and weekends, it's 20 minutes. Uh, they stop at the uh, stations. We try and strive for a dwell time of 10 seconds and I know sometimes folks are like, there's no way it's only there for 10 seconds. Believe me, we go out and time it. And that is our goal. Um, it features TSP, transit signal priority. So if you've ever been uh, on the Swift Blue Line corridor and you see that green light and our bus goes, that means we're getting a little bit um, extra time to uh, get through the intersection before the general purpose traffic starts. There's now real-time information at all our SWIFT stations, so you know when your next bus is coming. Um, and then the, the thing that I really love about SWIFT is when you talk about community transit's vision for travel made easy for all, we've really designed SWIFT to be accessible for all types of people that want to use it. So we have um, that higher than standard curb. So when people are stepping from the curb into the bus, it's a very small step. Um, they're fully accessible for wheelchairs. We integrated a passive restraint system. So our wheelchair customers can have the freedom to roll themselves onto the bus. They bring an arm down and are able to secure themselves. That has been a really, um, popular feature and something that we've incorporated into our fixed route service as well. And then you can see there the picture on the right, we continue to be uh, have a lot of pride about our onboard bike racks that were designed by uh, CT mechanics. So people who have their bus and they're waiting at a Swiss station can be at that third door boarding. So on the platform, they see that bus icon, they know that's where they go with their bus. They board the bus and then secure uh, their bus right onto uh, the rack. Next slide, please. So I wanted to give you guys a project status update on where we're at. Um, in my new role, I'm really striving to make sure, as Deb says, to stitch everything together so folks uh, are feeling really good about understanding where we're at. Um, so we've talked a little bit about Blue Line. If you'll go to the next slide, Rachel, I just wanna remind everyone uh, that the Swift Green Line, which was our second line of BRT opened in March of 2019. It's about a 12.3 mile corridor serving uh, Painfield and Boeing. You know, we built that beautiful facility, the Seaway Transit Center um, on 75th and Seaway across from the Boeing Administrative Twin Tower Building, and then uh, connecting to Bothell Canyon Park. Um, the other significant thing about the Green Line is it created the network, right? So it has that uh, connection at Airport Road and Highway 99, and we'll talk a little bit more about that important connection and the transfers that are happening there. Uh, this was also the agency's uh, first capital investment grant small starts uh, project. So that significant $43 million that we received on this project. Uh, through the first year of SWIFT, so from March of 2019 to March of 2020, we had a little bit over uh, 600,000 boardings, which we were very pleased with. Another interesting fact is that we're seeing um, a significant growth on Sunday. So boardings have increased from year to date uh, on our Sunday service for the SWIFT Green Line. Next slide, please, Rachel. So Swift Orange Line, we're what we, in what we call project development. It includes design, engineering, and environmental for this project. And just a reminder to orient you, I know it's hard to see the slides on the computer, but um, we're starting at McCollum Park and Ride, coming along uh, Mill Creek Boulevard, up 164th, uh, along uh, 35th, and then um, serving 
the, both the light rail station at um, Linwood Transit Center and then the Western Terminus at Edmonds College. We'll be building a new terminus at Edmonds College. Um, I'm sure Mayor Smith is happy to hear that. We'll be coming out of the bus loop and building a terminus out onto the street. Uh, and also um, at McCollum, we'll be doing some significant improvements there at that facility, along with 13 station pairs. The orange line will connect to blue line and it will connect to swift green line. So again, that network connectivity. And the most exciting thing that I think about this project is it will be the first BRT to light rail connection in Snohomish County. So it's really going to transform how people can travel in the county. Next slide. We are also working on our Swift Blue Line expansion project. So you'll remember right now that we currently uh, terminate, we started Everett Station along Highway 99 and we're uh, terminating that route at the Aurora Transit Center. This project will extend uh, out to uh, about 1.7 miles to the city of Shoreline and it's going to serve that uh, 185th Street station, Link Light Rail Station that Sound Transit is building. One thing I failed to mention, and it's the same for uh, the Swift Blue Line, is there is a significant amount of coordination that happens with our local jurisdictions. Uh, the city of Linwood widened uh, 35th. They're completing that uh, roadway project to a three-lane profile, which was really uh, crucial for us to serve with Swift. They're also um, putting in bat lanes along 196. So the coordination between uh, our agency and our local jurisdictions is really crucial. And the partnerships with the city of Linwood, with Snohomish County and, and city of Shoreline have been really important and really beneficial as we're building out this network. Uh, so we're going to phase this project into two phases. Uh, the phase one project uh, will uh, be complete in 2024, same with Swift Orange Line. So we're up and running when uh, light rail comes to Snohomish County. And the first phase of, of Swift Blue Line will include um, building the Swift stations at, sound, at the Sound Transit Light Rail Station. So they're going to put in the platform for us. We'll come in and construct the stations. We'll be buying expansion buses. And then in the scoping process of this project, we really identified for the full Swift Line speed and reliability improvements so that we can uh, increase the efficiency uh, of this service. We'll be doing phase one speed and reliability improvements from Casino Road South. And then after we get those complete in 2024, we're gonna go back and look at speed and reliability improvements in uh, the, within the city limits of Everett. And when uh, Blue Line expansion is complete, we're looking at having daily boardings of 9,200 daily uh, boardings, which kind of blows my mind. I mean, it's just really incredible that we're gonna just on that line have 9,200 boardings. And I can't imagine that it, it'll just continue to go up, so. All right, next slide, please. I wanted to share with you the decade look forward um, for our network build out. So we've talked about SWIFT uh, blue line that we started in 2009, Swift uh, Green opening in 2019. For Swift Orange and Swift Blue, we are going to be having those complete by 2024 to feed that light rail system that's coming to the county. Uh, Mayor Neering, this is for you. So originally we had a Swift Red Line. We have gone through um, an internal process to look at the colors of our lines, make sure that they sync up with what other agencies are doing. So you now have the Gold Line, which I think is, you know, the Gold Star. It's much better. Uh, we're okay. looking at be beginning a scoping study for that in 2022. And, and then uh, getting that constructed and up and running and serving North County by 2027. We also have in the next 10 year plans to begin um, looking at Swift Green Line expansion. So that would uh, be um, extending that. Uh, the city of Bothell is uh, going to start planning to widen Bothell Way. So once that uh, roadway infrastructure uh, profile is increased, we would be serving UW Bothell. And then eventually the Silver Line, which is the newest thing that maybe you haven't heard of, that would be going out to Cathcart, serving that facility that the county has purchased and is continuing to develop there. All right, next slide, please. 
So my coworkers will know that I try to send out these emails every new once in a while called COVID perks, which are just positive things about COVID because we're looking for anything that is a positive note these days. And one of the things that has been so heartening to me is what our SWIFT service has done during the pandemic. SWIFT uh, boardings have been extremely strong um, during the pandemic. Pre-COVID, our SWIFT ridership was about 25% of our system, which is incredible. Currently, our SWIFT service uh, is about 44% of, of the system. And that has resonated with me uh, that folks are using this service and it is an essential service for our community, even in the midst of a pandemic. We shared these uh, statistics with our FTA uh, headquarters staff and our regional staff, and they were just so impressed at uh, how SWIFT was performing. The other thing that has been uh, really good is uh, Mary Beth and her staff have been working on a piece that talks about all the essential services that SWIFT connects to. Just with SWIFT Blue and SWIFT uh, Green right now, we have 26 essential agencies, such as the Department of Health, Everett Clinic, Swedish Edmonds Medical Center, and then community testing sites for COVID that people are able to take SWIFT service to. So the SWIFT network really is about expanding access to our community and changing how people can travel, making it easy, travel easy for all, which is our vision. Next slide. So I really wanted to tra transition into telling you this story about the vision of the SWIFT network. This is a multi-decade decade build out of the system. It's gonna provide connections, making travel easy for all. And we've heard Emmett talk about this quality of life issue. And when I think about the build out of this SWIFT network, I want you all to think about how would you plan your life differently? How would you plan your day differently once this network is in effect, once you have this opportunity? Uh, behind me is a picture of that my son sent me from Utah State where he's going to college. And one of the things he talks about is when he comes home from college, probably right a little bit before 2024, where would he want to live? And the goal is for him to not have a car. And so he looks at places like uh, Ashway, downtown Everett, where he's going to be able to access high capacity transit service, bus rapid transit, regional rail. And that's all a big part of this network vision. Next slide, Rachel. So one of the things that uh, you want to have happen is making transfers easy. And that's what been one of the goals of SWIFT. When we connect two frequent high capacity transit services with an integrated fare payment system, customer information, so they know where they're going, they have the wayfinding, it opens up a whole new uh, opportunity for people to travel. You can see on this chart, and it's a little hard to see, but if you can orient around the two um, red circles, this is showing how popular the connection between Swift Blue and Swift Green Line was within just a few months of opening uh, last year, and the number of boardings at the airport and Highway 99 crossing point. So it's really significant that it shows that's the, the largest place. And on that corner, you have a Swift station on every corner. So you can go east-west, you can go north-south. The options are you know, endless for folks. The combined network of blue and green opens up opportunities for travel that folks have never had before in our community. Customers are able to travel from Linwood to Mill Creek, from Everett to Canyon Park without worrying about a schedule, right? Because you can look at the customer information sign and it tells you when your next bus is coming, 10 minute frequency. And that's really what we want people to connect to. We want to make it as easy as possible for them to travel on our SWIFT system. Next slide. So the other thing we've been doing is really try to stay in sync with what industry research is supporting when it comes to building out a network. Um, this guidance we have here, and it's a lot of language, it's really illustrative, but it comes from the Who's On Board 2016 survey from the Transit Center. The takeaway is this, growing ridership requires development density. So you need to have places for people to go, population density, employment density. You need to have it be walkable. So people have to be able to get on the sidewalk to where they need to be. They need to be able to cross safely. And you need to focus those development walkable communities 
with frequent, reliable, fast transit. And that is SWIFT. That has been the vision. That's what we're seeing come to fruition with this network. Next slide. The other thing that is so exciting to me with regional light rail coming is uh, the integration between our system of SWIFT and what's happening with uh, Sound Transit. And you can see here, and this is interestingly enough, this is Sound Transit's map that they're using. It shows our SWIFT routes on it, it shows how significant that connection is to feed people to the light rail spine. And you can look and see um, as the light rail system is being built out in the Pacific Northwest and how Sound Transit is also putting their stride bus rapid transit uh, into place, SWIFT is all those places connecting everywhere. There's not a gap in that system. And that's really how the network begins to thrive. Next slide, please. We talked about development a few slides back. Um, I think it's really exciting that SWIFT is attracting new development. Uh, Mayor Smith will be very familiar with that city center picture up in the left-hand corner. To the right is a uh, Swamp Creek, which will be adjacent to uh, the SWIFT stations that we'll be building for the Orange Line. On the bottom is Metro Everett. And, and this is my favorite uh, here on the right. Um, you can see that when we built the blue line on the corner of 196 and Highway 99, there was a vacant lot. And now it has a Five Guys, a Mod, Pizza, Starbucks, uh, Sprout, and that development coupled together with that SWIFT station is exactly what we're talking about. Um, the SWIFT network is part of this Vision 2050 growth strategy. It is working together with the city's local uh, comprehensive plans. I remember 10 years ago when we started uh, talking about this, especially with Snohomish County, and now we'll see that our transit emphasis corridors, these corridors that we've identified for bus rapid transit service are incorporated in our jurisdictional uh, comprehensive plans. That is so gratifying to see that those efforts are synced up together. Next slide. I'm almost done. Uh, the other thing is uh, with the 2024 network, it's really important to note that the SWIFT network will connect to four uh, out of the five regional centers that we have designated in Snohomish County. And by 2027, we'll be serving all of them with the gold line going from Arlington to Marysville. These are the county's largest population and job centers, and they will have access to fast, reliable SWIFT service every 10 minutes on a week day. Next slide. So here is where the vision all comes together. Um, it's about vitality, important elements of our community's future, providing this accessible transit, integrated with Sound Transit's regional transit. It's an economic driver, so it's connecting to a population and job centers. It's a critical component in the regional and local growth strategies. And this generational build out of high capacity transit will provide a world-class public transit network for decades to come. And that's really exciting. It feels like a real homage to what we're here. And once again, it goes back to Emmett talking about quality of life. With this build out, I only see an improvement for our quality of life. Time is so important and the things that we'll be able to do differently when we have access to this service. And with that, I thank you very much. You can take any questions or Roland can take any questions. Any... I'm not sure. Oh, sorry, Melissa. Go no, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Mayor. A great presentation. Any questions on this at all? <laughs> Very exciting to see uh, the plans for the future and all that SWIFT has accomplished. Melissa, thank you for that. And uh, CEO Heath, go ahead. Well, no questions, but um, throughout Melissa's uh, presentation, I was making notes of things that I wanted to underscore uh, with the board. And darn, if she just didn't cover every single one of them. Um, I, I started off of my introductory comments uh, at the top of this meeting, reminding that we not only were operating a fixed route bus system, but we were also investing in the growth and expansion of, 
of that system and other products with a $278 million capital program. If, if you look at community transit and all you see is a local fixed route bus system, you could ask some questions about how we are allocating our operating revenues to support all of our activities. But if you look at community transit and you see a local bus system overlaid with a bus rapid transit system with all the points of connectivity to an emerging uh, regional light rail system, if you see the DART services provided to citizens uh, in our community with disabilities, if you see some of the other innovative products that Molly and her staff uh, are developing because of the way people's uh, travel habits are changing, you'll see that community transit is really a, a multimodal agency. It takes a lot of knowledge, skill, and ability in a lot of different areas to support not only our fixed route services, but all the other services that we provide, not just today, but uh, for the future. I, I also started by saying that I felt a sense of excitement coming into this meeting because I knew what you were going to be hearing. And I hope that uh, the presentations you've seen on the strength of our financial systems to, to support this agency, uh, the care and the service we're providing to the more vulnerable populations in our county and our plans for continuing the growth and expansion of these services is an exciting vision for you as it is for me. Um, I'm really feeling that. It might be the pinch of, of uh, coming up on a, on a retirement, but gosh, I am just so proud of the role that community transit plays in contributing to the quality, quality of life in this community. And, and Melissa, thank you for hearing that message and for repeating it. So um, I'll stop there. Feeling a, a very proud CEO. And I want to thank my colleagues, the folks I work with for all the great work they do day in and day out. I'm done, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, with that, um, I'll go on then to uh, Chair's report. And I did want to update you, as, as was mentioned earlier, on the CEO recruitment process. Uh, the CEO position, as you all know, is currently open, and applicants are encouraged to apply um, by tomorrow, actually. The job is posted on Community Transit's website, the Employment Jobs page, and Keras Consulting has been advertising it uh, quite broadly. Keras uh, provided an update to the executive committee last week and shared that they are pleased with both the quality and the quantity of uh, candidates received to date. So that's really good news. I think we're going to have a nice pool to choose from. In November, the executive committee will review the applicant pool presented by Keras Consulting and conduct our first round of interviews. So looking forward to that. Then on Tuesday, December 1st, the board will interview the candidate finalists and make the CEO selection, uh, hopefully shortly thereafter. Board alternates are invited to join the board on December 1st to meet the finalists and offer input uh, for the board in its final consideration. I wanna thank all of you on the board for making time in your busy schedules to be involved in this critical process. Um, it's very good to, to see that, thank you. Um, one other item of note that I wanted to discuss with you is uh, that of Emmett's official retirement date. You might recall that when Emmett announced um, his retirement, he agreed to stay on and serve as CEO until the new CEO was selected, which I was grateful for. Um, with the recruitment process on schedule and finalist interviews set for December 1st, as I mentioned, um, Emmett and I were talking about this earlier and he's officially submitted his retirement date for December the 25th. So um, we both agreed that the end of the year is a good transition point for the agency and I'd like to Thank Emmett again um, very much for agreeing to stay on through this recruitment process and, uh, and through the 25th. Obviously, he's not, not done yet. Uh, it, I really thank him for that, and I know the board does as well. It's uh, nice to have him at the helm as we make this transition process, and we will have time over the next couple months to do a proper goodbye to Emmett. Uh, so I look forward to that also. Um, in, a, in the event, I would mention that Emmett's uh, retirement date precedes the start date of the new CEO, then we would just look at a short-term interim CEO that would need to be identified at that time, but I think there's a good chance that that won't be necessary. So we'll, we'll worry about that if, if, uh, if in fact that becomes a reality. So in sum, the agency has good momentum. Um, 
a strong experienced executive leadership ship team in place to provide uh, for this seamless transition that is coming. And uh, we look forward to this process as it begins to reach uh, the point of getting uh, real and, uh, and of culmination. And um, I'll have another update for you at our regular board meeting, hopefully on Thursday, November the 5th. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Feel free to contact me or the staff supporting this process or Cesar uh, and, and Deb Osborne. You can also contact them and get updated as board members at any time. So thank you, CEO Heath. Thank you, Deb, Cesar, and, and uh, to all the board and everybody involved in this process that is going very smoothly and very well. And that, um, that concludes my uh, report. And so with that, I will go to board communication. Council member Dottry. Uh, I don't think I have anything for right now. <clears throat> have, have a great uh, weekend coming up and we'll see everybody on the 5th. Thank you. Council member Marine. Uh, no, just I'm very happy to uh, be back on the board. It seems like yesterday. And so thank you all, and uh, go Hawks, 6-0. and oh. That's right. <laughs> Council Merrill. Uh, nothing for me for today. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Nearing. Council Member Nearing is still on. If not, we'll go to uh, Labor Representative Norton. Maybe having some unmuting issues. I see both of them on. This is Nate. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, great. Sorry. I was having connection issues. I don't have anything to add, but really appreciate the reports we've heard this afternoon. So thank you to staff. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. And is Labor Representative Norton, are you, are you able to uh, unmute? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Go ahead, Lance. Yep. I had a quick question for Emmett. Okay. Emmett, is there any update on the talks with Everett Transit? Sure. Uh, and I can plan to provide a more complete uh, update at your November 5th meeting, but basically Mayor Franklin continues to lead a review of three alternatives for uh, Everett Transit service in the future. As you know, one of those alternatives is the possible uh, consolidation or merger with, between Everett Transit and ourselves. We are continuing to take the, a position of support uh, to the mayor. It's her evaluation, it's her lead. Um, we're supporting them in every way we can to complete their evaluation. And our position, the position we've taken with them is that we are ready, willing, and able to serve in the event they should decide to take a ballot measure to the people of Everett. Um, to see if they want to join community transit. Uh, the alternatives review is ongoing through the rest of this year into next year. And I think uh, the, the city is looking at perhaps the end of next year to get to the point of making, uh, identifying a preferred alternative. If oh, that thank you, Emmett. Uh, yeah, if that, uh, Mr. Norton, more than happy to provide any information on any other specific questions you might have. So just let me know what those might be. Thank you. You're welcome. Great, thank you. And uh, thank you, Labor Representative Norton. Council Member Roberts. Well, it's just good to be uh, back. And uh, it's amazing to me, it's not amazing to me, it, it makes sense that community transit has continued. I mean, I've been gone for five years and the, the, the advancement, uh, you know, like uh, the, the swift lines and that is just uh, very, uh, very amazing. And I'm just looking forward to serving uh, with a, a great team. That's it. Thank you. Great to have you. Um, Council member Shwedi. I uh, have nothing to report. Mayor Smith. Well, just, I guess, uh, to follow up with Emmett's comments about the staff presentations. Uh, the enthusiasm that you all presented with today was remarkable, uh, and it, it kept me awake, and it kept me with a little <laughs> smile on my face. 
<laughs> so I, you're, you're just great representatives of community transit uh, and brilliant, of course. And then I guess I'll share, uh, probably read it somewhere, but uh, Peter Rogoff with Sound Transit and I uh, hosted um, Congressman Larson at the um, Monolith Terrace uh, transit site. Uh, and what felt really good was being able to stand there and, and articulate how well the partnership is going between community transit uh, and sound transit. Uh, and so I just appreciate that the collaboration is solid and, and uh, uh, appreciate the, uh, being able to just say that with, with no hesitation. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yes, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. If I could just briefly piggyback, I neglected to mention earlier that um, Peter Rogoff, CEO of Sound Transit, is scheduled to join you all at your next board meeting on November, I believe it's 5th? Yeah. 5th. Yeah, uh, November 5th. So um, look forward, to, uh, I hope you're all there. Look forward to hearing an update on Sound Transit's uh, status um, at your, your next board meeting on the 5th. And second, everything Mayor Smith said, I've never, I've never, felt a stronger spirit of communication, collaboration, cooperation between our agency and Sound Transit. It's a great relationship and I'm a great admirer of the work that Peter Rogoff and Sound Transit are doing. Thank you. And finally, Council Member Wright. Uh, thank you. Um, and just to tag on to Mayor Smith's um, comments about uh, Rick Larson, the county, we took Rick Larson um, further up the, the um, Sound Transit line to the Ashway Park and Ride and a few other spots also. So appreciate um, him reaching out and being part of those tours and thinking ahead with us. Um, uh, exactly what everybody else said about the staff and the presentations this afternoon. Um, it's just amazing seeing everybody work together and the excitement and the enthusiasm. So I'll give Emmett credit um, for putting together such a fantastic team and elevating people. And then my original comment was just gonna be welcoming Joe and Sid back to the board. So, you know, it's a great board and a great agency when you get board members back that want to serve. So um, it's great to have you guys back. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I think I got everybody. Did I miss anyone? All right. Is there any other business related to the corporation? Staff, very good workshop. Covered a lot of territory here. Budget, start, swift. Uh, CEO update. So good stuff. Thank you. Um, and we will look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks on the 5th for our next board meeting. Thanks, everybody. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all for giving us so much time and so much patience. Love it. I'm by all.